we kind of coerced. There it is. Um, we tried. We tried. Kind of coerced Elizabeth into stopping by. They brought me two books because um, I didn't have time to get them signed Saturday at her book signing. So I, I told them how you can drop them off at the school. She has been our consultant for the Memory Project bench, and the students have been meeting with her. And Elizabeth, we have a really big surprise. Mm -hmm. These wonderful people have donated money for the bench. Oh, wonderful! Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Summers ago, I was uh, retracing my steps in front of the school, and when I got to the corner, I wished that I could rest there. Um, but um, again, thank you for allowing us to come. I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we've been doing lately. Um, I have a book called uh, "My The Worst First Day." Uh huh. Thank you. Um, an old person's uh, heart to move. Thank you. Um, and but it's, it talks about more than the what uh, what happened the first day I attempted to go to school. Um, we talk about the, the things that happened inside the school, and um, even in the 1950s, um, I was shocked because I was not accustomed to violence. I had never heard of violence in schools, and let alone it being tolerated. But um, only one of us was a senior. Um, most of us were juniors, and there were three uh, freshmen. Um, no, senior, juniors, and sophomores. sophomores. Uh, back then, uh, senior high schools um, started at the 10th grade. Um, do you have any questions? It might be a little easier. What do you want to know? <laughs> Please. Tell us real quick what you did at that bench. Oh, um, that was the only day that I was able to go to school by bus. And uh, I knew that the National Guardsmen were there. But, but the governor said that they were there to preserve, preserve peace and order. And um, I had to walk two blocks from the bus stop to get to the corner of the school. And uh, I, had, I saw the soldiers break ranks to admit students. But I didn't know that uh, their orders were to um, not admit us. And so when I approached the soldiers, they Close ranks, and I walked to you know Central is two blocks wide, has 26 entrances. Um, so I, I thought I, I thought well maybe um, this is not where I'm to enter. Very very naive. Um, so I walked at, where, to where there was another set of sidewalks um, going toward the school, and this time the soldiers crossed rifles to bar me. Um, and then um, I said, well, I, I'm probably supposed to go to the main entrance. <laughs> so I made a third attempt. And this time, the soldier directed me across the street where the angry demonstrators were. I had heard them along the way. See, since this school is very, very familiar to me. I had to pass it going to other schools. Um, I had to pass it going to my grandfather's store. Um, so that I knew that there was another bus stop. That's what I was headed for when people were howling around me and um, immediately in front of me was the press was there. Now, I had grown up as a very shy child, a very obedient child. Um, when I talk about my childhood, I, talk, I call my mother the queen of no. You know, <laughs> understand. <laughs> pretty soon why, but um, this time when I asked to go to Central, my mother, who was hyper-vigilant, overly protective, she didn't say no this time. She said, we'll see. We'll see prevail from the spring to the summer to August when um, the names of some of the students who were 
to go were in the newspaper. And by then they were from, it went from 85 students down to 17 students. This, uh, the, the district intended limited token desegregation. The plan that they had that was accepted by the courts um, would have dragged on for, ye for years going uh, different levels of schooling. Um, so I, uh, my parents finally said yes, and we had to go have um, an interview with the superintendent. And he announced only two criteria, that the students selected had to be good students and they couldn't be troublemakers. Well, my, my experience with troublemakers is somebody who kept on chewing gum. <laughs> um, talked uh, out of turn. Or maybe somebody who had a fist fight on the schoolyard. That, that was my vision of a troublemaker. Uh, and I was accustomed to principals being very authoritarian and having control of the schools. Um, I'm so old, I, I'm forgetting things. <laughs> um, so uh, as you asked what happened at the bus bench, I finally got over there. Uh, meanwhile, people were uh, saying get a rope, string her up. And all kinds of horrible things. I, I, I try not to repeat hate speech, but if you live in, live in America, you know what American hate speech sounds like. Every place has it. Um, when I uh, went to the bench, there were two um, middle-aged report, white reporters there, and um, they welcomed me and started talking to me I did, I, you know, all the time when the press was asking me questions, they were right in front of me. Um, I, I didn't say anything. Um, I think I mumbled my name at one point. Um, I talk differently now because of my experiences with the press. You know, a shy person doesn't want to be interviewed. Um, so, the reason I changed my speech is to hurry up the interview so they could get gone. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I remember Benjamin Fine said to me, don't let them see you cry. And I was grateful that I was wearing sunglasses. I, uh, pe people asked why I was wearing sunglasses. Because when I'm out in the sun, I can't see unless I'm walking, looking down at the, at the sidewalk or street. So it's necessary. Uh, um, while I was sitting there, a white woman came and confronted the crowd. Um, she said that she wanted her little girl to go to school with Negro boys and girls. That infuriated them. She said that they should feel ashamed. But today, there are a few people who have not been uh, converted. <laughs> but um, it seemed to take a long time for that bus to come. She and I walked across the street where there was a drugstore. I intended to call a cab. Um, the proprietor locked the door before I could get there. So I had to turn around and go back and sit down at the bench. But there were two things I've learned about recently that happened that um, probably helped ensure my safety. There were four local reporters, one of whom I had known from his writing that he was a staunch segregationist. But they felt that they needed to be a human barrier behind me so that nobody could um, attack me from behind. In addition to that, I, I finally saw a picture nearly 55 years later, of a soldier over in that area. He had been sent by an officer um, 
to ensure that no physical harm came to me. Because um, it, it was really a very, very dangerous time. Later, newspapers <coughs> estimated that there were maybe 150 to 200 people there. Um, after we were turned away, we t I turned to the NAACP. We had not had, my family had not had in involvement in the, with the NAACP. But again, while I was sitting and still waiting, um, Terrence Roberts, one of the nine, came over to me and uh, to, uh, offered to walk with me to, as far as his house. I had some, my sister and I had sometimes walked home from Dunbar um, so that we could use our bus fare for donuts. <laughs> <laughs> well, I knew that the uh, parents turned off uh, from the Main Street uh, to Howard Street a few blocks from the school. If I went to his house and waited a bit and then walked home, it was not the distance that, that deterred me. It was the uh, prospect of being attacked when there were not other witnesses. You know, sometimes other people around um, tempers people, and, and, um, but they don't, they don't do their worst in public. Eventually, um, a, 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 another person came, and a black man, and offered to give me a ride home. <clears throat> I recognized him, because he was um, the publisher of the weekly black newspaper, and he and his wife's pictures were often in their newspaper. So I recognized him, I knew who he was but I had the voice in my head, the queen of no, no don't, don't walk away, don't go anywhere with strangers. Mm -hmm. And so even though I knew who he was, I did not know him. <laughs> Mother didn't know him. <laughs> <laughs> um, eventually I got to the Arkansas School for the Negro Deaf and Blind, and that's where my mother worked in the laundry room, thank you. You know, um, somebody who's very close to you can know their body language. My mother's back was turned away from me, but I could tell from her posture that she had been praying because she had heard irresponsible reports from uh, local radio that I had been injured. Meanwhile, my father was driving around trying to find me. He had Toby with him, his 45. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, see, my father um, worked a split shift at the, at the train station. And um, he worked very late at night. Mother was at home with six kids. And so she used Toby if she heard anything. <laughs> He would shoot out the door. <laughs> um, so uh, people around us got accustomed to hearing gunshots every night. <laughs> because later, uh, when we didn't have any type of protection, Daddy was away at work. Two of our male neighbors volunteered to uh, check around our house late at night. And that was a tremendous undertaking, knowing Mother. <laughs> <laughs> it really was. Um, I, I'm going to stop here because um, these kinds of things are in the book. Mm -hmm. Let me just say, I'm Eurydice Stanley. I'm Elizabeth's friend and protege. We've been friends for 20 years. I'm a retired lieutenant colonel in the Army. I met her when I went to the old visitor center that was in the, in the Mobile gas station across the street. And there was a picture posted called Reconciliation, a poster called Reconciliation. And I was working on my dissertation addressing the issue of racial reconciliation in the Christian church. 
And I saw that poster and I thought, wouldn't it be incredible to meet these two women and find out how they got here after the famous photo that I'm sure you've seen time and time again. So they gave me their phone numbers and they let me interview them. Don't try that now, but <laughs> this was 1999 at the time. 97. 97. It was the 40th anniversary. Well, I didn't, we've been friends for a long time, as you can see. <laughs> but the bottom line is, I kept asking her, Liz, why don't you have a book? And I am saying to everyone in this room, I'm a lieutenant colonel, I, I, so I know what it is to be at the higher levels that you all are. You all are at higher levels than I was. But what I'm saying to you is, there are civil rights icons in our midst that are not being remembered. This book directly goes, Liz proceeds from this book Liz is involved, she hasn't been before. And that has always driven me crazy, okay? So we have books in the back, we can order more, <laughs> because seriously, we talk about the impact of uh, bullying in this book, we talk about toxic environments. Anyone have a toxic environment in your workplace? Anyone have employees that you need to bring back into the fold? We talk about that in the back of the in essays in this book. It's written completely in verse. So it's a civil rights Hamilton. <laughs> but the key point, and it has uh, correspondence in it from President Eisenhower. Can you imagine having command reports about nine children trying to go to school? And that beautiful young lady that you saw walk in with us, my daughter, She's 15 years old. She's the same age Elizabeth was. So en envision her walking through this crowd and being screamed at, threatened to be lynched, spat upon, and think about the burden that Elizabeth has carried for 60 years. Now, as you can see, she is engaging and she is wonderful now, but it has taken a very long time to get here. And every time she talks, go ahead, say it there. Well, um, I've always talked extemporaneously ever since I was in Chicago, backstage, preparing to go on stage, and I didn't have a single note with me. So it's all, so from then on, it, it was extemporaneous. Um, I'm not shy anymore. <laughs> But I, I still am a, not an aggressive person. Um, but she's surrounded by aggressive people. <laughs> <laughs> I was t earlier I was talking to a friend um, who um, directs a group of students who volunteer to, to uh, retrace some of the steps of the civil rights movement. By the way, the Civil Rights Movement was accomplished by ordinary people taking, very, taking great risk, sometimes risking their lives, particularly in the voting rights campaign. It was accomplished by ordinary people knowing their environment, and in spite of that, um, taking these chances. So. Um, Everybody knows the famous people, but also realize that the greater chances were taken by ordinary people. Sometimes they were college students from the North who went to Mississippi in the voting rights campaign. Um, I have a presentation for you, ladies. Oh, oh. Excuse me. He has a little presentation for you. Elizabeth, would you mind standing back up for just a second? Okay, you gotta help, help me, please. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Elizabeth, for sharing your story and the earlier Bench Project. And as a token of our appreciation of this conglomeration of Rotary Clubs from all over the United States, 
we'd like to share with you our ambassador's scarf that you noticed on the way in. Yes, and I If you'll wear that it. proudly, mm -hmm. I'd like to put it on. Okay.